everybody. We are scrambling. We were going to try to use our um, new sewing studio space that we've set up upstairs. Um, got everything set up. Everything looked pretty. We had all our samples out and everything. And then we're like, oh, yeah, the Wi-Fi up here sucks. The guy's supposed to come on Thursday to fix the Wi-Fi. I don't know why I forgot about that, being that I'm the one that made the appointment with the guy to come fix the Wi-Fi. So we're kind of scrambling. And the store's a wreck because we were opening a bunch of boxes and, and making a bunch of kits. And so just don't mind the mess while we do this. So the kids are setting up sewing machine and ironing board and Frogger's being demanding. And yeah, so happy Monday. Today we are going to do a demo on doing a hot dog burrito inverted tube. Oh, uh, what are all the other words I have heard this technique called? I always call it a hot dog pillowcase because it looks like a hot dog. Um, I guess you could call it an enchilada pillowcase if you really want to. But, and I know that you guys have probably made hot dog pillowcases before, but I'm going to show you a couple of tips to get some better results, like things that I always didn't like when I made them. I'm going to show you how to work around those. But we are in the process of collecting pillowcases for... Um, essential healthcare workers that are um, kind of frontline COVID um, workers. So that is the reason for doing the video today so that you could easily have some tricks and tips to make those and then um, donate them. Pillowcases. So last weekend I decided to come in and sew because it was New Year's or whatever day that was. On New Year's I decided to come in and sew and I made a bunch of pillowcases and I told you guys about them but I had taken them home to give them away to everybody. But these are the pillowcases that we're talking about. This one I've taken home, so it already has cat hair on it. I love Alexander Henry fabric for pillowcases because you have this giant, amazing print that you can't necessarily figure out what to do with on a quilt, but they're perfect for pillowcases because you almost always get the whole repeat in one side or the other of the pillowcase. So on this one, I did these red metallic um, octopuses, of course. And then on the cuff, I used this metallic cotton and steel fabric with a just sort of a, a silvery gray batik for the little accent piece. I know this is extra. It doesn't add that much work, but it totally makes it look cooler because and it gives you this extra little um, step in between. I have in the past done decorative stitches on this before I put it in the pillowcase so it kind of looks lacy. I've written written words on this so it's like a message when I give it to somebody. Um, I've done all kinds of things just on this little bit that you can do in your regular sewing machine. You don't have to have an embroidery machine and it makes this even more cool. Um, if you're going to do embroidery on the cuff what I do is I take and I fold the piece of fabric in half, I fold it in half, I fold it in half again, long ways. Then I fold it in half this way. So then I find this middle part. So this is the middle part of the whole cuff or the whole pillowcase. And then I use perfect sticks so I don't have to hoop anything. And I line those marks up that I made with um, the marks on my hoop and I just stick it in there and then I don't have to hoop it and then it's straight. And then if it's not straight, I also use my luminaire. And so I kind of turn it a little bit so that it's straight on the line. So there's easy ways to get through um, embroidery, but I will stitch it on the cuff before the cuff is put on so that you don't see the back. It's all encased inside. Um, so this is the case I made for me. This is the case that, <laughs> that um, this is the zombie pinup girl pillowcase fabric. So this is an Alexander Henry fabric too. This comes with a gray background or a purple background. Um, and then I did this because it kind of looks like skin and this because it totally looks like blood. So nice creepy pillowcase. And then Jaden picked out this fabric for his, which is also an Alexander Henry fabric that is a, um, like a border print, not really a border print. I can't remember. I'm not sure if there's a word for this where it's, more dense, the, the printing is more dense on one end of the fabric and then it gets less on the other side. So it's perfect for a pillowcase because you have all of the pictures on this side and then this has more dark background. 
but it's like um, koi fish and cranes and sashimi. and sashimi and flying sushi. It's just fabulous. And then on the cuff of his, we used that new Juicy Juice Entwine fabric. So this is a woven. It's very soft on here. So if you, if I, sh if when you saw that entwine, you're like, yeah, but I don't really sew clothes, and I'm not sure what I'd use it for. This is probably my favorite pillowcase that I made because this is so soft. It feels like um, like well-worn wool almost. So this would also look really cool if you did some embroidery on it. But today, since tomorrow is my parents' wedding anniversary, I am making pillowcases for my parents. So for my dad, who is a car fanatic, I'm using the muscle car fabric. And I already started on his so that it was one less seam he had to watch me do because I am actually gonna do this step by step each piece. So I had plans on you know put it, laying them all out in different steps, but then I thought, no, I'm gonna show exactly how to get there. So. Keep an eye out for your newsletter in the next two or three days with the details about what to do with these pillowcases and then a, um, a video link to this will be in there too so you don't have to go and find it. So this is what you need. You need three quarters of a yard of a main print of fabric. So this is the fabric I chose for my mom's pillowcase. She likes tulips. She's also a pink person. So this is the body of her pillowcase. These are both Alexander Henry fabrics. These are both uh, Gasly's fabrics. This is gonna be the cuff. This is gonna be the accent piece. So what you need is three quarters of a yard, a third of a yard for your two main prints, and a two inch strip. So if you've got some leftover jelly roll strips, they're perfect to save for this because it's just the right size. Just trim it down a little bit. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our two inch strip and press it in half. Pretty simple stuff. I always press out the fold first because I'm weird like this. And I had everything set up in my studio space upstairs because I've got my big ironing board and my big sewing machine and all that good stuff. So this just takes a little bit longer on the smaller mat. You guys know I'm a big fan of steam. Everything just makes things crisper and smoother with steam. You want this cuff, one of the tips is you want the cuff to be really evenly pressed because the thing that makes these pillowcases really last is that all of the seams are enclosed. So you can wash these to death and the fabric will fall apart before the seams if you put everything together correctly. Um, Jaden still has the pillowcase I made him when he was like seven and he still uses it most of the time because the seams are all encased. So we've got this nice, clean, crisp piece, okay? Next, we're gonna come back over to the cutting table. And this is where everybody goes, huh, when we make these. This is our cuff piece. And I don't cut the selvages off until, there's a step where I cut the selvages off. So this is our cuff. We're gonna put it right sides up. And this is where it just, you know, it's a little bit bass backwards, but you can get there. We put our little accent piece right on the top of the cuff piece. We'll line the rest of that up in a second. Then we're gonna take our, the body of our um, pillowcase. This isn't really directional because the tulips go up and down, so it doesn't really matter. If you're weird about the direction things are gonna go, pay attention when you pick the fabric out because um, because you know depending on how the cuff goes so like for example my octopus fabric is directional but i intentionally did it so that the octopus is facing the opposite direction from the um the cuff so that it was kind of the right way on both sides i'm going to use wonder clips and i'm going to kind of just messily do this first sorry i talked through that we have right sides together of the cuff the accent piece and the body of the pillowcase I'm clipping them together with Wonder Clips. They're not gonna stay there that long. But here's another tip. Make sure that all of your fabric, the edges of all of your fabrics line up perfectly. You don't wanna miss any of the seams. 
because then your pillowcase won't stay together when it gets washed. So we have all of our pieces put together. So now you have a little um, accent piece sandwich between your cuff and your pillowcase. We're gonna take the body of the pillowcase, this is the hot dog part, and we're gonna roll it up. You wanna make sure that you roll it so that it's out of the way of your needle. If you're really nervous about that, get it to about right here and then put a, you know, put a pin on this end and a pin on that end. If you get it laid out on a big surface, it's not usually a problem. Then you're going to take the cuff and you're going to make it, you're going to just make this whole big, now we're going to call it a bun because here's your bun and here's your hot dog. I just put the clips on for now to hold it. You want to make sure that you are keeping all of your, all of your fabric um, raw edges straight with each other. Okay, so we want our bun to be all, you know, straight line. I'm just going to put the clips on for now, and then we're going to pin. The reason for that is I want to be able to take it all to my sewing machine without it coming, without it separating. And once you've got the clips in here and everything's lined up on the top, my suggestion is to let the messy ends be over here on the selvages. So you just want to kind of check and make sure there's not any real drastic puckering or weirdness happening. Okay. Then I'm going to take my pins. I pin backwards to the way most people do. Most people will take a pin and put it in like this. The reason for that is they want to be able to pull it out as they sew. I don't do that either because the pin is put there with the intention of holding it while you're sewing. If you pull it out as you get there, if it's not so much on this, but on things that you're trying to be really detailed with, now the pin has stopped doing its thing right before it really needs to be doing its thing. So I leave the clips on so that I can just put a couple of pins between each clip. I like these pins because they're really long and they're really thin. So they just sort of slide into the fabric without really bowing it at all. And they're also heat resistant. So if you got all of this done and then you were like, oh shoot, I've got to go and iron this out. You don't have to unpin it or worry about melting your pin heads. You can just go ahead and iron it. All right. So now we have our hot dog ready to go. I'm going to take these clips out because we don't need them anymore. We're going to go back to the sewing machine. Frogger break. <laughs> Frogger break. So we want to do a quarter inch seam allowance on this. You don't have to do a scant quarter inch on this one because you really do want it to be, you want to make sure that you catch everything. Um, this one, and I go ahead and backstitch at the beginning because you're going to kind of tug on it when you, when you pull it right way out. So we're just going to sew, uh, I can sew a little bit wider than a quarter inch here. Quarter inch or scant quarter inch? A scant quarter inch is just slightly less than a quarter inch. So it's sort of like when you're baking and they ask for a, for a scant cup. You ever had a recipe that asked for a scant cup of flour? I have not. It's kind of an old school thing. There will be like a, a scant cup is a cup less a tablespoon. So it's just a little bit less than what that measurement is. So, you know, most machines have different ways to get the scant quarter inch. We're gonna talk about that when we get to some piecing videos. This doesn't have to be wonderfully perfect. This is why this is a kid's sewing class. And we're gonna do a kid's, so, uh, um, a demo that's good for kids once a month. This is just our first one. So we sewed that whole seam. We're gonna pull these pins out. Since it's a hot dog, we're gonna grab the piece that's the hot dog, not the bun. So the body of your pillowcase, and you're just going to invert it. Since it's a really big piece of fabric, it turns pretty easily. I hate turning stuff, it drives me crazy. These are so easy though. Um, and what I did when I made those dozen pillowcases or whatever last week is I just did all these steps one at a time. So by the time they were done, they were just all done. So 
now what you have is a cuff on your pillowcase where the seams are all encased. Okay, so this is gonna be the inside of your pillowcase, but you don't have any raw edges. Here's a tip on the pressing part, because this gets a little weird for people sometimes. I will press it from the inside of the case first. So from the back, and I'll tell you why, because it's not gonna be straight on both sides. And I would rather make the front part that you're gonna see really straight after the fact. So if it's going to press some weirdness into it, let it do it from the, you know, from this side so that when you go back to the front, you can easily press it out. So I press from the inside. That gets everything happy on that side so that when I come to this side, the back is gonna lay really flat. So now what I do is I take and I actually push the cuff up from the accent piece and press it because I don't want any folds in there. I want this to all be flat because when you sew it together, you want the sides to line up. Now I have this sort of big bowl up here. Go ahead and press that flat now that you have this flat on both sides. Go ahead and press your end because you're gonna have to match that up in a second. How well does all that stay ironed after a wash? It's fine. The ironing, you want the ironing in there because you want everything to line up when you sew it. Mm -hmm. And then once you sew it, everything's where it's supposed to be. Okay. I mean, it's not going to look like it's freshly ironed crisp cotton, but right. it's not going to, it's not going to wrinkle up. Okay. It's not going to be a wad. Um, so now I've got the whole cuff pressed and everything's straight. Okay. So now I'm going to take my cuff. So now it looks like kind of like pillowcase. Incidentally, if you want your pillowcase to be a king size pillowcase, use one yard of here. So instead of using three quarters of a yard, use a yard. I'm gonna take it and fold it wrong sides together. We're also gonna learn how to do French seams today. French seams are really popular in clothing because it makes your clothing last longer. Um, we don't typically do them in quilting and you don't typically do them when you're just making a pillowcase, but it really does make it last longer. So I'm just gonna take and fold them wrong sides together, okay? Then I'm going to take to my mat here, and I'm gonna fold my, my pillowcase in half. This is just to trim off the selvages. You could leave the selvages in there if you really wanted to, but it would make for a really, really, really fat seam. So I've got everything folded. I'm gonna take my, I'm just gonna take my ruler and trim off The, a, a healthy trimming of the selvage because I want to make sure I'm getting rid of all the selvage. So if you fold the selvages back, you can see the words on everything. You want to make sure that when you cut into it, you don't have any of the selvage pieces left. Okay. When you're cutting this, you also want to make sure that your ruler line lines up to the fold of your pillowcase right here. Okay. So I'm lining up to this fold this fold is straight, and then I'm just going to cut this all off. Now, I've got these already put wrong sides together. Since we're going to do a French seam, that's important. You want to pay attention to the fact that this fold lines up over here so you don't have a weird seam on the side. Okay, you can pin this if you want to. You probably don't need to. Now here is a tip on French seams. You want to make sure that your seam allowance on the first go is smaller than your seam allowance on the second go. However you get that on your machine is your business. What I do is I leave my needle in the middle position. I'll put my needle down. And then I'm using the inside of my J foot here as my reference point. See that? So here's the inside of that plastic bit. I'm gonna use that as my reference point, okay? Um, I like this machine because it'll do a tie-off stitch instead of a back and front. 
and um, then you don't have that huge wad at the beginning. So we're gonna make sure, we're gonna double check and make sure that these are lined up. And then we're just gonna sew all the way down the side. So when you get here, you can sew off the end or not. And I'm just gonna turn, oh, that got sucked up in there. Oh, I broke the thread. Of course I broke the thread. Of course I did. All right, so here's another little tip. Anytime you re-thread your top, you should take your bobbin out and put it back in. Because there's no real way to know if that's what broke your thread or if this is what broke your thread. And normally we would just turn this corner, but no. So the bottom. Another just random sewing tip. I see a lot of new sewers will start sewing and they grab the fabric back here and pull it. You don't need to do that. As long as your feed dogs are working properly, that you shouldn't ever have to put your hands behind the needle. Um, what that does is it creates too much strain on the on the needle because you're pulling it and the feed dogs is moving it and that's a good way to break your needle. So we're gonna poke the corners out on this one. I like my, um, my metal precision tip turner for this. This isn't a super fine point that we're trying to get. So um, a chopstick or whatever, we'll get that too. Now here is where things get somewhat time consuming. I know this seems tedious, this step seems tedious, but it really does make a difference. And since we only stitched two seams, we're gonna press this out. Um, here's a tip, and I always think of Ferris Bueller when I do this, but if you lick your fingers and then roll the seam. I totally do that. It totally works. It works. It works. <laughs> but I think of Ferris Bueller every time. He's pretending Remember that he's sick and he's like, it's juvenile, but if you lick your palms, <laughs> yeah. then they feel sweaty and your parents believe you're sick. Um, so I will just press a little bit and then you want to just continually roll this hem out. It does help if you use your point turner ahead of time and press the seams out, but my point turner is upstairs. So see how the seam is right there at the top? That's really important when you're doing this French seam and you'll know why the first time you don't do it because what ends up happening is you can see your fabric when you turn it. When you get to the point where the accent piece is, there's a lot of fabric right there. So you want to roll that seam out the best you can and you're probably going to want to hit it with a little bit of steam because there's so many layers. So now we have our right sides together and we're gonna make our last little stitch. So some people will sew all three sides because they want it to look uniform. I don't care that much, but you can if you like. This is the width of our seam now because we did that skinny seam. So now I'm gonna take my foot and I'm gonna use the outside of my J foot See where my needle is? I'm pretty far out from it. But just to be safe and just to assume that I didn't press, I didn't stitch everything perfectly straight, I'm gonna bump my needle over a little bit. So it was in the center position. I'm gonna move it over about a millimeter and a half. You wanna stay stitched this beginning because this is the part, of, this is the part of the pillowcase where putting the pillow in gets the most stress. And then we're just going to stitch like we did before, down the side and then down the bottom. And then we're going to stay stitched this corner too. Well, we're going to try to. We're just going to tie that off. So now what we have is it even looks really nice and clean from the inside, but when you turn it right way out, I 
and you can repress it if you want to, if you want to make it look really nice for before you give it away. Um, and there's always just a few little threads that come from the piecing that I always just snip off. Now you have a really fancy pillowcase. Yay. So when you do the French seams like this, you end up with all of the cases and seamed. You still end up with some thread sticking out. So I just take little snips and snip those off. They're always there no matter what I do because it's the edge of the fabric, but they're all encased in there. So you have this really nice, really finished couture style pillowcase. Aren't you fancy? And look, that whole process took us, what, 24 minutes? I love that you could. And it's cute. It's it really cute. So, like, I see where a lot of people will take, like, I don't know. Uh, so, say you liked chickens and snowboarding and uh, brownies. You could get three different fabrics that represented all those things for your friend and make something that is very unique to them. So, that's it. You want right. to? Okay. Some people will top stitch the cuff right here before you make the case. So when you make the whole thing and you press it, some people will top stitch it here. I've never really needed to do that. Um, and I, it would drive me crazy if my top stitch here didn't actually catch here. So I just don't do that. Okay. All right. So a couple of things that you're going to want. You're going to want clover clips. You're going to want long pins that you can sew over. You'll notice that when I sewed my initial seam, I didn't pull my pins out. I don't fly over them either because that's a good way to mess some stuff up. But if you use a long, thin pin, then you can sew over them. That's why I put the heads the way that I do so that they stay facing out and I can sew over them. Okay. Um, a point turner is really helpful. I like the point-to-point -point turner and I like the precision um, turner tool. The point-to-point -point turner is nice because you can put it inside and you can push all those seams out. Um, let's see, an iron. A long enough ruler that when you fold your pillow pillowcase in half, you can trim the side off. I was using a 24 inch ruler. You could probably get away with an 18. Um, and then remember you need three quarters of a yard, a third of a yard and an accent piece. I can't tell you how many pillowcase kits I have made for people who will call me up or send me an email or whatever and they're like, hey, I really like this, this fish fabric that's on your website. Can you put stuff with it that'll make a good pillowcase? I do it all the time. Um, I make, anytime I make a quilt for anyone, I make a set of pillowcases from the leftover fabric or from fabric that coordinates with it. Because um, normally, you know, you've got some left. I always buy extra fabric because I assume I'm going to mess up and I do. So I usually have enough to make, they don't necessarily match. They're just the fabric that's from the quilt. And then I fold the quilt up and put it in the pillowcase and that's how I give it to them. Um, I love making these and it really is, it's not that hard to do it sort of assembly line. And that's what I'll do. I'll cut them all up. I'll press all the pieces. I'll pin them all together. I'll sew all the tops. Um, and then if I can sucker somebody into doing the pressing for me, it doesn't take long at all. So it take, took me 25 minutes to make one, and I think I made 10 in two hours the last time because I, I did it like that. So Okay, so I hope, that, I hope that you pulled some tips away, even if you've made these before. I hope that you learned something new that you'll try. Really do try either some flannel or some wovens. Um, if you've got some wovens laying around that you're not sure what to do with, try it with this because it's really easy to work with it. And since the, since the seams are all encased, you don't have to worry about the fraying because woven fabrics tend to fray a little bit more and you don't have to worry about the fray because they're all encased inside there, see? And this really is like the softest thing I've ever felt. I really think I might just make myself a whole pillowcase out of this one, so. Um, or if you've bought those really cool big prints and you're not sure what to do with them, make some pillowcases. You can always use pillowcases. It's a heck of a lot better than the ones you buy, you know, four in a pack for 20 bucks. So anyway, so that's what our demo is today. I hope you guys play along with us in the collection stage of this. For those of you that joined us last 
season for our brown bag mystery quilt. We're doing that again. Um, it starts, we're gonna start pre-selling the bags uh, probably Monday. We, we're allowed to start pre-selling them on the 15th, um, but I wanted to be able to show you some stuff on, if I can, if I can get some kits together, I'll sell them or I'll show them to you on Friday's video. If you're not sure what the brown bag mystery quilt is, you will also get that as an email and um, we've put some teasers up on Facebook. Basically what it is, is we build you a kit. It goes in a brown bag so you don't see the, uh, you don't really see what's in there. It's a mystery. The fabric is a mystery. The pattern is a mystery. Um, I've seen the end result of this year's mystery. It's a really cute quilt. And the way we do it is you get the bag. The bags will sell from January 15th until, well, they'll sell until we run out of them, but they'll sell until March and then you get your first clue in March. Um, and then every two weeks you'll get a clue. When you buy the bag, you put your Facebook email address on a little card and we'll do that both in store and online. And when you give me back the registration card, I will add you to a private Facebook group where Karen Montgomery will teach you how to make that quilt. The only way to get into that Facebook group is if one of the stores that's participating is um, act actually adds you in there. So you can't just say, hey, I wanna play. You have to buy a bag. Um, we had so much fun with them last year. And what I did last year was the bags that we sold in the store I took one piece of the fabric of one of the fabrics that's in there and I tied it to the bag so you could kind of get an idea of what it was. So you knew if it was batik or reproduction or something crazy or black and white or whatever. Um, and, uh, and then you just took the bag home and you waited for me to send you clues. We started the brown bag right at the beginning of the shutdown last year. So we ended up having to physically mail all the clues. Um, the way it's supposed to work is if you bought the bag in store, you can come into the store and pick up your clue. And if you bought it online, then we physically mail it to you. But it is a lot of fun. It's a really great program. And in the club or in the Facebook group, everybody, it was so much fun to watch everybody get their bags and take them home and open them and check them out and get all excited about it. Cause then they would post a picture of what their fabric was, not knowing what the quilt was going to look like. Um, because they trusted us. So, you know, I know they're living dangerously. All right. I think Have a good one. See you later.